So in the interest, like you said, Taj, of not looking at the past, let's go, everybody's here, let's talk about what's new for 2025, transition to that. Of course, everybody, you've seen the cars outside. Of course, we have three new colors. Uh, we have the stereo purple, the competition yellow, which are outside, and we're bringing back the uh, Sebring orange, which we had, which was our signature color for the 2019 ZR1, so we thought bringing the ZR1 back, we bring that back. Too. And we also have an interior that goes well with it. You can see that in our white and purple. We have a narrow orange uh, interior for 25. And we also bring in a uh, blue stitch package. That's in the black zero one. And that's uh, in addition to the red and yellow stitch, you can get blue now. And we've upgraded the, uh, the, the leather to leather airbag covers for all Corvettes. So 1LT and 2LT, get that standard. We have a new Z51 wing, which is really, you can see that outside as well. And new wheels for Z06, new 10 spoke wheels. Uh, we have, you can see that outside too. We have the black version and it's available in four different finishes. We still have, so we have actually nine wheel choices uh, included with the three carbon fiber for Z06 now. But we're here to see Z01. <coughs> Accessories are other wickers that you can touch on as well. 
and that's what's done. Here again, we, we like the uh, both options for performance and aesthetics. Here again, another, another picture of the science group. The upper portion is within our tools and what we do to study. Uh, we do a lot of pressure mapping. We, we do some, we've got programs that will allow us to see flow paths and things like that. So um, the reason that is there is that is the best position for us to extract air from the bucket side of the car. And here's another view of it. Also, we've, we've, we're on our second generation of carbon fiber wheels. We've, our supplier has been exceptional on this as far as what they're able to do in that. We challenged them after the first one, and we have the five spoke one that's out there. Um, fairly thick on the spokes, so we asked them, we did it the second generation, can we do something that not only was lighter, but looked lighter? So we kind of challenged them, can we get these spokes down to like 10 millimeters in depth, maybe six millimeters in section? And, uh, and they were able to do that, so it was a very impactful wheel. Super lightweight, it comes in half the weight of the aluminum wheel. And then the drivers will tell you they, they feel the difference with driving on these wheels. Here's a shot of you brought, brought in some blue wheels. You know, if you kind of look at the market, you see some of our competitors will, will get into colored wheels. And, um, their colors are pretty flashy. We, we felt like it was neat to have something on it, but we just we wanted something that, that was more serious. And, uh, uh, bringing back the blue color is part of the part of what ZR1 is, and then so having the blue wheels, matching blue stripes, uh, like blue stitching, uh, things like that, that we think help make the, the ZR1 even more iconic. Yeah. And here Carlin talked to the wheels, and that the neat thing about these wheels is we used a topology program to develop these wheels. The topology program will, will find the best uh, strength pattern. It, it's kind of, it looks like when you see it, it's all done, it's kind of coral looking, you know, it's kind of rough. Um, but what we're able to do is we learn from the patterns and then we streamline. So everything that you see there is very functional, it's lighter weight, but it's also also done with purpose in that. So the, the, the thing that we always look for is, is a double win. We look for it to be a cool looking wheel, but also very functional in how it performs. I want to let you talk to the interior. Yeah, so um, this one on the interior, uh, the ZR1 does have a unique stitch pattern on the doors. You can see that the car is outside, and we get special for that. And of course, all the touch points, um, like Josh says, we don't want you to forget what you're driving. So you have the steering wheel, the silk plate, and the black, uh, telling you you're in the ZR1 as well, if you didn't know already. And then of course, on the gauges, we had to do a special engine boost gauge for zero one also. And the uh, design, um, we, like Kirk was saying, the blue, the edge blue theme goes into the engine and the zero ones will come standard with the engine appearance package of the carbon fiber closeout panels on the coupe and the uh, engine window on the convertible so you can always see the zero one engine LT7 in there. These were our uh, cars we had at the reveal units. We have two of those here, actually two and a half if you count the yellow for the chassis. So we had the yellow, we had the one one we only have here is the stereo vertical. We have the white with the, with the habanero uh, convertible with the ZTK package and the black with the blue accents. So we're gonna turn over to Josh to talk about what you really want to know about the engine. And uh, thanks for Harlan. Uh, I know Jordan Lee's here. I don't know if he's in the room, but he is here, and he's doing a seminar this afternoon. There he is, hiding back there. Uh, so he and uh, his team of brilliant wizards uh, made this all possible. So if you want to know more about the LT7 engine, I encourage you to attend Jordan's uh, seminar this afternoon. The one thing that we want you to take away uh, from the LT7 and its development is that it is not an LT6 with turbos on it. So if you're thinking, I'm too impatient to wait for a ZR1, I have a ZL6, I'll just build some turbos on it and see what happens, I wish you luck. <laughs> uh, the LT7, along with the LT6, were developed together uh, with two different missions in mind. Of course, the LT6 was all about naturally aspirated performance. We wanted to extract as much power out of a naturally aspirated engine as we possibly could. We, 
rev it to the moon, we use a flat plane crank, you get the bank to bank breathing, all the goodness that comes with that, and then the natural Helmholtz tuning of an intake manifold designed for natural aspiration. With the LT7, we asked Jordan and his team to, no excuses, just do the most powerful engine you possibly could. And we wanted to do turbocharging for a long time. It's well known that turbos are more efficient than superchargers. Superchargers take a lot of horsepower just to turn the supercharger, whereas you get uh, some free energy with hot exhaust gas uh, moving a turbo to do that charge for you. So when we designed the eighth generation Corvette, we had this engine in mind. Uh, we knew how wide it was going to be, we knew where it was going to package, designed the body structure around the packaging for this engine, doing all this planned from the beginning uh, to do what ultimately ended up as the, the ZR1. Um, they do share the, the block, the bore spacing, 4.4 uh, inch bore spacing, um, and the basic forging of the crank. But after that, their similarities uh, kind of end. Uh, the cylinder heads are all new and completely different, designed for uh, a boosted engine. The compression ratio on the LT7 is lower, so where the LT6 has 12 and a half to one compression, uh, the LT7 is a 9.8 to one compression ratio. And uh, of course, we had to boost up the loop system. There were some things we joked that were kind of hidden on the LT6, if you knew where to look, you could see that maybe we were planning something different. Uh, the dry sump tank, for example, had a scallop in it that looked a little bit odd. Well, that scallop was to eventually make room for a turbo. Uh, we had, on the LT6, a six scavenge pump dry sump system, but there was a stage for a seventh that was unoccupied. Uh, we're now using that to lubricate the turbos. And these turbos are massive, uh, 76 millimeter turbos. Um, giant and help make that massive horsepower uh, that the LT7 produces. And so our big paranoia was turbo lagging. Uh, that's one of the downfalls with a turbo, especially one that makes a lot of power. The last thing you want is some kind of latency and throttle response. That needs to be very predictable, pre predictable and measured. And so we did a lot of cool tricks to minimize lag. We call it anti-lag. A lot of it is in the hardware design itself. Uh, so the cylinder heads, for example, the exhaust ports are pointed instead of up to get out the exhaust manifold, which are basically marine-style headers on a Z06, are going down into the exhaust manifold that has an integrated turbine housing on the LT7 to make the shortest path possible between the exhaust valve and the turbine wheel. That, that's one way to minimize lag. And then on the other side of that, we keep the compressor wheel as close as possible to the intake valve, so we reduce the size of the intake manifold, use the, the physical space of charged air to minimize lag, and then we have uh, electronic wastegate control, so we can measure boost and uh, maintain as much as, as possible with feedback from an integrated speed sensor. So when you're on the track, you're blasting down the straight, which is, pretty much non-existent. One corner comes after the next when you're driving a car with as much horsepower. You get off the throttle and onto the brake. We can maintain boost with that hardware. We're also using cam phasing and spark timing, a lot of trick technology and software uh, that helps us do all this, this good work. Okay, to me the most impressive thing, there's a lot of impressive things about the LT7 and the ZR1, but one of the most impressive things is this torque curve. <laughs> If you look at it, it's around 800 foot-pounds of torque from 3,000 RPM all the way to 7,000 RPM for a peak at 828. But that torque is relentless. And some have asked, hey, you driven it, what's it like to drive? And it's really just words. I, I can describe it, use all these adjectives. It's not really describable. Uh, if you've ever been on uh, a roller coaster that has one of those linear motors or been and a car that can launch really hard, like an E-Ray, for example, where you feel your whole chest cavity just compressing in. You feel the blood rushing to your back, uh, your face getting sucked back. Imagine that experience that just doesn't stop. It just, just keeps on going. Josh, I mean, I'm not the expert here. I think that's not a torque curve. It looks like a torque line. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's massive. And to put it in some perspective, uh, just to show you ZR1's past, so the 90 ZR1, um, I was in high school and that car changed my life when it came out, I just gotta tell you. <laughs> I knew I wanted to be a, an engineer in Corvette, but when that car came out, it was solidified. 375 horsepower, sort of the start of Corvette entering uh, the supercar world. Um, and the LT7 is making that much power at 2800 RPM. The 2009 ZR1, 638 horsepower at 4100 RPM. And the last ZR1, the legendary uh, seventh generation ZR1, 755 horsepower at 4750 RPM. Obviously the 2019 ZR1 was no slouch. Uh, in fact, we used that car to train some of our drivers uh, as we progress through the driving levels inside of General Motors. We figure if you can handle the 2019 ZR1, you can handle a lot of car. And of course the ultimate peak on the LT7, 1,064 horsepower using 93 octane pump gas. You don't have to put ethanol in it. There's no tricks or gimmicks. You don't go and get a special cow from your dealer that voids your warranty. All of this is fully backed. It meets all of our standards for any engine. Uh, we run it through all kinds of abuse tests just to make sure that um, we can stand behind all this power that you get right from the factory. In fact, we planned for, obviously, the power output of the LT7 and updated, upgraded our dyno facilities in Pontiac, Michigan. We upgraded two dynos uh, to be able to handle the LT7 because the dynos we had in the lab would not have been capable. And even after that upgrade, we managed to break the dyno. Uh, as, we, as Jordan and his team kept turning up the wick, finally we reached the limit of the dyno and physically broke uh, the input shaft of the dyno cell itself. We like to say the engine tried to free itself from the shackles of a dyno. <laughs> Another interesting thing is that in the dyno lab when we're running full poles, the exhaust temperatures reach some pretty extremes. In fact, uh, the turbine wheel uh, sees temperatures that are about two-thirds that of a space shuttle tile on re-entry. So they're just glowing red and the exhaust stacks that come out of the dyno lab see similar heat. So we have to measure and monitor the temperature of those stacks. And when they get too hot, we have to turn the dyno off to let them cool down. We were joking that uh, NASA had a thermal imaging satellite over Pontiac, Michigan, uh, and was calling to find out what the hell was going on there. All right, some more pictures of the turbocharger. You can see there the integrated speed sensor I was talking about. We got a shrouded inlet port that also helps uh, maintain some boost. You can see the asymmetry of the exhaust manifold, again, describing how the cylinder head design has changed in a way that takes the exhaust ports to their most direct path uh, to the uh, turbine inlet wheel. And I mentioned the temperatures of it. The wheel itself is made out of a material that some of us hadn't heard of. Uh, until very recently called MAR. Uh, you can Google it if you're interested in it, but basically it's a step above Inconel. So it maintains very high mechanical properties at extreme temperatures, uh, super exotic uh, uh, stainless alloy. The turbo uses ball bearings. Every trick we can use to minimize friction and all help uh, to minimize lag. Some other cool things uh, when you look at LT7 that really tell it's design differences from LT6 and what we intended to do with it for power output. But if you look at the difference between the piston and the connecting rod, the beam section of the connecting rod, while both are titanium in the LT6 and LT7, the LT7 is much thicker. The wrist pin is very telling. I wish we had one here that you could pick up. But the wrist pin that connects the piston to the connecting rod on the LT7 has a smaller ID and a larger outside diameter. So the wall thickness of the wrist pin uh, is physically thicker. And then of course the top of the piston, which is a dish piston, uh, has more material to the top ring because of the pressures inside the combustion chamber that make all this horsepower. Here's a view of the cylinder heads. Uh, so again, fully CNC machine cylinder heads. These are real race car engines, just like the LT6. Everything you see about the engine uh, is very customized, intent and purpose built 
right across the street in our performance build center at Bowling Green. But you can see the difference in the combustion chambers between LT6 on the left and LT7 on the right. Uh, we've got larger combustion volume that helps lower the compression ratio that I was talking about. And then some of the cars that the ZR1 competes with, which is pretty much any car in the world. Harlan, you want to talk about the... Yeah, well, I'd like to I mentioned this before. I think that Mercedes-Benz AMG1 is about $2.7 million. It has 1,063 horsepower. I think they're going to have to rename it the AMG1 less. <laughs> And I think it's call ours the ZR1 more. Yeah, one more. Yeah. The way it works. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you might wonder, like, why, why is it 1,064 horsepower? Why not 1,050? Why, why not some round number? And if you look at the recent past of ZR1s, they've all been a number that's not nice and round. And that's because, like I said before, uh, we push our team to do everything that's possible. They work really hard to do everything possible. And we just went all out. Whatever we could get out of this engine, we did. Uh, and uh, the last pull in the dyno room when we had some good air and we're operating at our SAE procedures uh, was a very exciting time. We knew it was going to be a big number. We didn't know it would be this big. So there's a lot of high fives going around, obviously. Historic. And it was also nice for us, you know, everybody online, read, read the forums, everything people think they know. It was nice to surprise everybody as well. Yeah, I'm kind of shocked that we were able to keep that secret because a number is easy to remember and say it's not, you know, it's not a picture. If you just spread your word of mouth. And as we were getting closer to something that was four digits, we started watching what we were even saying internally. In fact, uh, the engines are codenamed Gemini. There's a bunch of reasons for it. There's a twin, the LT6 and LT7 were developed together. Uh, flat plane cranks like two four-cylinder sharing the same crankshaft. There's a lot of parallels, the space program. But the real reason that we called it Gemini was to hide it. Even inside of General Motors, Corvettes are a secret. We always have a, usually have a code name for the whole program. And even the engine in this program had a code name for a code name. So sometimes we confuse ourselves uh, with all our secrecy, but it was really great that we were able to keep it a secret for as long as we did. And, and very historic at reveal. Kurt talked a little bit about the aerodynamics, the body design, the exterior design surfaces, and just like any Corvette, maybe even more so on the ZR1, every square inch of the surface serves some functional purpose, uh, whether it be for cooling airflow or for downforce. Uh, the ZR1 is this optimization project for what we can do with design uh, in terms of airflow and cooling. And in fact, we make more downforce on the ZR1 than any car, any Corvette we've ever done, any car General Motors for sure. 1,200 pounds of downforce uh, at top speed on the, on the car with the aero package. And then that 1,064 horsepower needs to be cooled off. So if you look at the rolling chassis outside, you'll see some of the 15 heat exchangers we have to manage cooling, whether it's the coolant in the engine, the transmission, the loop systems in both, the charge air in the engine, everything needs to be cooled. And the car is a rolling example of an energy transfer. Um, so the heat rejected from the engine, we cool off. And of course we want these cars, just like we're abusing the engine, we're abusing the whole car. Uh, in its final stages of development. In fact, that's why we revealed about a month ago, if, if we could, we would have waited longer. Uh, because when we reveal a new Corvette anticipation builds, some people think, well, I'll be able to get one in a couple of months. Uh, that's not the case. We are finishing our final stages of development. And to do that work uh, in a representative way, we had to pull the camel off and let all this magic on the exterior start to work. Here's an example of Downforce, just a little set yourself with a Corvette lineup. Uh, an industry standard, at least, that we're trying to adhere to, so the comparison is more direct, happens to be 300 kilometers per hour. And this gives you an idea of the downforce uh, on each of the Corvette models. There it goes. Um, and then a little bit about the chassis. Um, one thing we wanted to do, our mission, which has stayed true for the, at least the last few generations of ZR1, 
We want it to, to make a ZR1 that's the luxury jet for the road, if you will. A car that's still approachable, still comfortable to drive. And so the standard, if there is such a thing, ZR1, uh, we set with a ride frequency that's lower than the Z06. So you can think of the ZR1, the two different chassis packages between the standard and the ZTK package, which gives you cup tires and stiffer springs, is kind of bounding the envelope of the Z06. So in many ways, while you're, we've got a car with lots and lots of horsepower, it's very, very comfortable to drive. Uh, Taj and I got to take a road trip recently in a standard ZR1. Um, and you would never know that you're driving a car with 1,064 horsepower until you ask for it. Uh, so super approachable, and of course the ZTK performance package is just like the engine was. No excuses, do everything you can uh, to, to get all out track performance from the ZR1. I think we're missing some sound. like to drive. Brian Wallace is right there. He's hiding. He's trying to hide. Uh, anyway, he's one of our hot shoe development. We have, and we can attest, it sounds like I'm bragging, but it's absolutely the truth. General Motors, and especially the Corvette team, has the most capable development drivers. And what I, a development driver is not just a race car driver. A development driver is an engineer that happens to be able to drive a car, and not only mixes those two talents, but as they're driving the car, can read what to do with the car to communicate to other engineers how to make it better. And when these guys got the ZR1 out on the Nürburgring last fall, and mind you, this is in the early stages of tuning. We're just, we call them bench cows. We're kind of using analysis tools to put what we think is the best guess in the car and go out and exercise it in anger for the first time. And these guys are out there, their first lap, uh, going 200 miles an hour on the Nürburgring. In fact, I think it may have startled some people <laughs> at how quickly things happen uh, when you're driving a car with this much horsepower. The quarter mile time is equally impressive. It'll be under 9.7 seconds, track speed of 150 miles an hour. Uh, just incredible. The LT7 produces more horsepower. Think about this. I happen to be a C6, Z06 proud owner. Engine made 505 horsepower. At one time, it was the most powerful Corvette we'd ever produced. The LT7 makes more than that power in one bank of the engine. Uh, and another interesting thing, I was talking about gas flow and through the dyno and the temperatures, just the flow of the gas through the engine. An engine's an air pump. The LT7 is a really efficient air pump. It moves a lot. Uh, that, that thrust of the gas flow through it is around 37 pounds. Uh, so you could almost move the car, just revving the engine if you could communicate that much power. And then moving that much air, uh, it will consume an Olympic swimming pool volume of air. So think about how big an Olympic swimming pool is in four minutes. Or better you add, imagine the hose it would take to fill an Olympic swimming pool in four minutes. Um, I can also tell you that all that power takes some fuel 
And uh, if you were to find a place on the planet that you could go full throttle in a ZR1 for this long, which doesn't exist, by the way, and don't try this ever, uh, but if you could find such a place, you would consume a tank of fuel, 18 and a half gallons, in about nine minutes. <laughs> All right. Should we, should we take questions? Totally true. <laughs> oh. 
guys bought brand new C8s and they were on the road, not a lot of miles on it, and it was a valve issue. What caused that? that I'm, I'm not sure which valve you're referring to, but I'll say this, that every single event that happens to a customer, we take very seriously. The 8th generation Corvette is, has the highest quality of any Corvette that we've ever done. Every car that comes off the line across the street is better than the one before it. It's continuous improvement. When you look at our warranty numbers, they're lower than they've ever been. That doesn't mean they're zero. And our, our target is to get them to zero. So whenever a customer has a problem, we have a dedicated team of a lot of people that pay special attention to that problem. We look at it very closely. We review data daily. And if we spot trends or issues, we react to them as quickly as possible. So oftentimes, Somebody will have an issue, and it gets a lot of traction on the internet. And um, while it's unfortunate that it happened, uh, there may be more um, stories about examples than there are in reality. So I can't answer your specific question because I'm not exactly sure what issue you're talking about, but you should all trust in the fact that we are working very hard to make every Corvette as good as we can make it. Would that have been rocker arm issue breaking? Valve springs, there you go, valve springs. We ran a race car, ran, my late husband ran a new set engine sprint car. So I've got a little knowledge on this, but, but there you go, valve springs, yeah. Okay, well, I, guys. I just want to take the opportunity to say that we actually, um, last year, won the J.D. Power Platinum Award, and that's not just for the best quality car as a sports car, that was the best quality of any car or truck on sale in America. Corvette won that award, and we won we won three years in a row with the second award too, and we compete against the best cars in the world. And we're telling people if you're driving something made overseas, you can upgrade your fun and upgrade your life, drive it, and your quality, drive a Corvette. Thank you, and I might have missed it, but did we ever get the uh, Nuremberg Times for the Z06? And so not, why not? You didn't miss it. Uh, we go to the Nürburgring to develop the Corvette. Uh, it's a special place that has a lot of different track elements all in one location. And generally when we're there, the car is not done. I was describing earlier about how we had the ZR1 there last year, very early in its development phase. So we go there to learn and make the car better. We don't go to set a track record. While that gets a lot of traction and uh, certainly makes some news, uh, that's not our primary mission and that's why we've not uh, reported an Nürburgring time. There are third parties that have driven the Z06 pretty impressively uh, around the Nürburgring and we're happy to let them do that. If in the off chance in some future as we're there, we can get a lap time in, we would certainly share it. We're not gonna share segmented times or what our analysis says we can do. We wanna be legitimate and share a full time, but we haven't shared one because that's not why we go there. We go there to develop the car, not to try to set a record. Okay. okay, I think we got to cut it off, but uh, we'll be around the rest of the day.